think these things may be effective or not. And sometimes I think, tell me if I'm being unfair, but sometimes I think we just do these things regardless of whether they make things happen. Regardless of whether they actually solve things. Regardless of whether they move us to a different place. We can sometimes become a little self-righteous in saying we held the protest. We spoke the truth. <clears throat> Even if all it did was reinforce positions on each side, we have stereotypes about government and governments have stereotypes about us. <clears throat> uh, I don't know in Indonesia if you follow football and how much you play football. Yes. You, you play football? Yes. Yes. football? Yes. So it's good. So think of football. You know, imagine if somebody told you kicking the ball to your left is the thing we should do. So everybody went on the pitch and always kicked the ball to their left. It's crazy, right? And yet that's sometimes what we do in civil society. We say, ah, let's do this, let's march, and we hold banners and we but maybe that's the wrong thing to do that. Just like in football, to play football well, it's it's about reading what is happening and is deeply and highly dynamic and responsive to what the other team is doing and what your colleagues are doing and what the opportunities are and what the constraints are. I think working for open government is also a little bit like that. My friend Nikhil is here and he can tell you much more about this sort of work. So at the risk of getting it wrong, let me say something about, about Gandhi, who I think inspires many people in India and around the world. If you read Gandhi's story, his biographies, you will see that he was an inventor. And one of the things that I think he invented, maybe not from scratch, is the art of claiming power by seemingly letting go of power. Here is somebody who claimed power by refusing to buy cotton made in the UK and wearing and, and wearing simple homemade homespun cotton. This is a person who mobilized huge communities and ultimately a nation by walking into the face of power when you knew at the end of that line you would be beaten on your heads. This is a person who claimed power by fasting. In these methods, there was a deep level of invention of how you engage with power and how you claim power, and a deep creativity. So I ask, what is our invention? How are we inventing forms of engaging with power today? And Gandhi, I think, was also a deeply pragmatic. He didn't only do this when the opportunity arose. He sat down with the authorities. He went to the UK and spent time with the trade unions and spent time with the with the workers in the textile mills in the UK and created a solidarity with the very people whose jobs were at stake because of these tactics. I think the point here is we need to be very clear about our goals. But in terms of how we get there, we need a deep level of creativity, a deep level of inventiveness, and a deep level of imagination. With the OGP, we have a set of tools, the, the annual plans, the, uh, the two-year plans, the IRM, the independent review me uh, uh, mechanism, consultations with civil society and government, the declaration, the summits, the governance structure. All these are important and we need to understand them. Or take the post-2015 agenda. There was the high-level panel in which Indonesia played a key role. There is now the UN processes and consultations and all of that. And I think it's really important to understand the rules of the game and the opportunities around these sorts of things. But if there's one thing I've learned in the last few years of engaging with OGP, is that the effective use of these will very much depend on a very astute reading of the times, of the signs of what is possible, of doing very good analysis, not lazy analysis. I think too many of the time we confuse slogans with analysis, or we confuse prejudice in our preconceived notions with analysis. It requires creativity, it requires connection. And it is often getting those things right, which are often informal and creative, that in fact opens up the pathways to making the formal processes work better. 
If we just jump to the phone more processes without having done the hard work, the creative work, they will not work. Let me talk about the final and third imagination. And I think this one is about the connection. Ultimately, as people said that the, before me, it's, if OGP is about people, then I think at the heart of OGP we need a connection with people. <coughs> and governments need, of course, a connection with people, but I think we as civil society organizations also need that connection with people. And we too easy sometimes claim to speak on behalf of civil society or represent civil society when in fact we haven't earned that or we don't deserve that connection. I often think that those of us in civil society leadership are much closer to those of us in government leadership than with most people. A few years ago when I went uh, and looked uh, at the situation in East Africa and spent time talking with people, as a person who has spent 20 years in civil society before I did that, I got a very rude awakening to realize that most people I was talking with didn't think much about NGOs and CSOs. They thought we were just out there getting money and doing a few good things here and there, but on the whole, their vision of life, their problems, their hopes, their aspirations had no connection with the work we were doing. It was a real wake up call. We have often, many of us have professionalized. I think that's good. Professionalization has helped us be better at certain things. We have to keep accounts. We have to account for donor money. We need to have performance reviews, etc., etc. All those things I think are useful. But sometimes the professionalization has disconnected us with people. We no longer know how to do the political work of telling stories that resonate with people. Or, or speaking through CS or the act of more importantly, of acknowledging and connecting <laughs> with people. This is about very basic things often. Basic things such as bread, such as right to food, health, education. It's about, as a colleague from TI said at the beginning, it's about giving birth. And can you give your birth in dignity and freedom and safety and without having to know that you have to pay bribes at the very process of giving birth to life in Zimbabwe or Tanzania or Bangladesh or anywhere in the world. And I think what we as civil society, maybe you don't, but certainly where I come from, I think some one, one of the things we have lost, and to me the OGP is an opportunity for us to reclaim this, is about the humility to be present to that reality of people's lives and the dignity and the indignities that they suffer. And I think that applies to government, but it equally applies to us as civil society. Especially those of us, like myself, who I think have been lucky enough to have lots of opportunities in life, such as our lives have in a sense moved on and somehow become disconnected with the very people we hope to serve and be of use to. There's a Peruvian theologian called Gustavo Gutierrez who wrote a book, a very influential book uh, in the world. It's an important book called The Theology of Liberation. And in that book he said that you know, no act of charity or giving or making wonderful things happen in people's lives is worth one act of solidarity with the poor. And I think uh, that's a message that I often forget. I think is at the heart of reinventing government. I think OGP is not only about reinventing government, it's also about reinventing civil society. It's about resonance, it's about connection. And I think one of the ways we can, one of the litmus tests of this is how do we treat people who are different from us. That is usually the first sign of the health of a society in terms of dignity. How do we treat not the majority but the minority? How do we take 
despite having a black president, an inspiring president for many of us with Obama, think of the everyday ways in which black people experience racism in the United States today. Or think about the strong homophobia in Uganda and many, many other countries, where people who are gay and lesbian are treated as third-class people whose dignity can be trashed openly and in law. Or think about closer here in Burma, where we see signs of progress from a military dictatorship which is encouraging to all of us. But look at how the minority group of Rohingya Muslims are treated and how the rest of us turn a blind eye to it. I think it is our response to the minorities that tells us whether we have reinvented government and whether we have reinvented civil society. So in conclusion, Perhaps you're disappointed because I have not given you concrete suggestions and ideas of how to expand and protect civic space or engage with the post-2015 agenda or make sure that the Indonesian government or the Tanzanian government or the 62 other OGP governments live up to their values and commitments. And I think that is important work and maybe I should have talked about it. But sometimes running to blueprints, running to mechanisms and tools actually be a problem if we forget the soul of the matter. And what I've tried to do is to try to say, let's get the soul of the first. These three imaginings, the analytical one of imagining governments as different, the pragmatic action one about how our engagement and action needs to be responsive, creative, and, and, and dynamic, and agile. And this last point about connection, of how our relationships with both citizens as well as our leaders need to be about connection, solidarity, and humility. Each one of these provides a really useful pathway to get OGP right, to make OGP happen. But I think it is when these three connect that you have the most incredibly powerful, potentially deeply transformative effect. When an ecosystem gets created, when these three rivers come together. How do we do that? How do we get these things together? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know of any place where it has been done. You get glimpses. There is no roadmap. I think anybody who tries to sell you a roadmap is uh, lying. There is no blueprint. There are no definite answers. But I think if we can summon up three things in ourselves, an abundant curiosity, acquired humility, and imagination. With those three tools, I think we can begin and hopefully get there. Thank you very much.